Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Trevor Block. I'm the CEO of Eurock. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome you all here tonight. Um, and we're obviously going to be talking about accelerating industrial data science. Um, so we're pleased to be hosting this event as part of Data Science Week 2021 um, in conjunction with the um, uh, WA Data Science Innovation Hub. Uh, so in the spirit of reconciliation, uh, VROC acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. Uh, we pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Um, so today we have two uh, very interesting speakers for you. Uh, we're honoured and privileged to have Dennis Marshman with us. Uh, Dennis is the Global Vice President of Data Science Customer Solutions at Wally. Um, his specialties include, but are not limited to, asset management, consulting, uh, strategy development, performance improvement, and reliability solutions implementation. <laughs> of course. We also have um, Dr. Sia Doshvapasand, who's uh, BROC's Chief Data Scientist. Uh, so Dr. Sia is a mechanical engineer with 10 years experience in oil and gas uh, downstream equipment design and integrity. Uh, he's also an expert data scientist with extensive experience in asset health uh, and integrity data analytics, uh, risk failure mode analysis, prediction and uh, production optimization. Um, and our facilitator for the interview tonight is um, Arvind Chetty. So Arvind brings four decades of energy industry experience. Uh, with a degree in mechanical engineering. Um, Arvind's held technical roles worldwide for companies including Scana Corporation and Schlumberger, uh, following which he switched to business development. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So today's event, um, we'll start with a presentation by Dr. Sia um, on data science in industrial settings, um, followed by an interview with uh, Dennis Marshman um, to talk about how industry is accelerating data science adoption. Um, after that, we'll have an open Q&A session where you can ask our speakers any questions that, that might be on your mind. Um, I think for the online viewers, um, you can ask a question at any time using the online um, chat box. Um, we'll get to them during the Q&A session. Um, and if we don't have time to answer your questions here, we'll um, email a response um, after the event. Um, so again, welcome to this event. We're delighted to have everyone here. Um, and we hope you gain some valuable insights from our speakers tonight. Um, so without further delay, I'll present Dr. Sia to talk about data science in industrial Thank settings. Thank you, Trevor. Thanks for the introduction. Thank you, guys, for joining us for this uh, data science week. is a, a pretty exciting time to be alive. That's data science week. Um, can I move? Do you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. So what I'm presenting here uh, well basically is our approach and the journey that we took in WIRAC uh, to how we ba basically we approach the data science in industrial environment. Let's kick off the whole week with the zero correlation between text and image. Uh, just uh, remember this beautiful ecosystem. I'm going to address it later. So we see a bunch of different species. They uh, basically coexist with each other in a beautiful manner, which is awesome. Uh, let's start with to be or not to be, who's the data scientist and what is the data science? I believe the crack is the data scientist. Uh, he, this guy or this girl sits down for hours waiting for the model to be run and uh, well, basically it's very patient. Uh, only a data scientist in the room can enjoy the CPU fan screaming. It means that the model is using every inch of the CPU to run. Uh, yeah, or <laughs> GPU. Uh, well, this is uh, very effective. Generally, the result that the data science get is very, uh, uh, high accuracy, but is not really efficient. Uh, data science, as we know, is a collaboration or combination of between different skills. So it can be a statistical, uh, scientific methods, uh, analytics to extract the valuable information from the data. And uh, the data scientist is the practitioner of uh, this method. So in fact, anybody can be a data scientist if your skill overlaps. Sorry. Yeah, there you go. 
So basically between computer science, math and statistics, and also if you have business and domain expertise and acumen, uh, technically you can be a data scientist. It depends on the leverage of the, which of these skills that you have. Uh, but the shiny bit at the top that everybody get excited about it is just the tip of the iceberg. A lot of things needs to be happening at the beginning, collecting the data through the sensor, through multiple sources, moving and storing the data, data migration, data lakes, uh, exploring and transformation, a lot of cleaning. Are we gonna get involved with tennis probably in many projects where we have? Aggregating and labeling, learning and optimizing, and at the end is gonna be the, basically the exciting bit. But how's the current and future market? So it sounds very promising. The whole artificial intelligence market uh, is currently more than $300 billion and it's uh, forecasted to hit the 500 billion mark at uh, on 2024. Uh, if we look at this chart here, so we can see that some of the growth in uh, basically the departments like CRM or enterprise resource management is slowly stagnating, but AI software platform is still growing. And in a sense, the application development, which is related to that one also growing. So why is that? Why only AI software development is uh, basically growing in this market? I reckon the whole industry is trying to address the biggest inefficiency in the data, traditional data science, which is the self-sufficiency. In fact, uh, the traditional data scientists is too much rely on IT, DevOps, data engineers, the whole IT department, or basically this will create a sort of domino effect. It will uh, slow down the job. And at the end, uh, the only thing will suffer is the ROI. Service says uh, only 22% uh, percent of the companies are getting the expected ROI from their data science team, uh, which is not really great. So what's the self-sufficiency? What are the examples? Launch environment. Uh, many of you guys as data scientists, you might work with the local machine or virtual machine, but you have to get the permission from, from your IT department, provision it for you, or in more sophisticated way, you're gonna work with the containerized pre-configured tools uh, to run the model. Even when you run the model, you create the model, you need to pickle it, you need to up make the model object and hand over it to the IT department again. So they're gonna be solely uh, basically responsible for the model. The data scientists will lose the connection to the model in terms of the contingency, in terms of the maintenance, in terms of the future validation. And uh, in another way, more sophisticated way, you can deploy your model as an API or either if you're working on a distributed environment, you can work with AutoML software tools, which is already pre-configured and they are production ready. This tiny bird here is an AI software platform. It can be anything. It can be AWS uh, SageMaker, it can be Azure Databricks, and it's a, in a sense, in case of some of our clients, it can be a VRAC platform. In a way that this small bird is helping the croc and making the croc life easier by eating from his teeth or cleaning the teeth and basically uh, helping him to uh, make his uh, hunting abilities better. The data science uh, teeth can be sharpened by uh, AI software uh, platform. But how about, how about these guys? Who are these? Operation and asset management. They carry a lot of load, a lot of responsibility in the, around the plants. Uh, well, basically, they are responsible for the major portion of the plant. And normally, they come, come across as a very small team. Uh, the global asset performance management market is huge. Uh, is growing fast. However, the predicted maintenance market, uh, which can be benefited by AI, is growing even faster. So how we can help these guys? Can the bird that was helping the crocodile 
can help the hippo as well. It depends on the type of a bird. So we can't expect an engineer tomorrow morning to start to use AWS SageMaker to start to do coding because they're already busy, they're not gonna do it. Over the years, in VRAC, we reached to a sort of experience or philosophy that 80% of the engineer's problem that it can be benefited by AI, can be solved by themselves, by using AutoML, and the rest of the more complex and more sophisticated problems that needs to be done by a data scientist is gonna be done by data scientist teams in collaboration with SMEs. Like this group of bears that is a feasting out of the ticks and bugs uh, of the hippos and making his life easier. So we might be able to set up this arrangement in any organization. So if your organization uh, got a data science team at the same time, you got multiple engineering department running around, they can use, they can get benefited both by AI software platforms. So <clears throat> what does 80% uh, of the problem look like and what about the rest of the 20%? So we're looking at the asset health dashboard built by uh, an asset engineer in a plant using Virage platform. We're looking at the uh, feed water pump data coming in. The engineer is looking at only five sensors, uh, which is the suction flow rate and bunch of temper temperature around the bearings. At this point in time, the asset tripped on a high rise, uh, basically high temperature. So we see that like around 12 hours before that, the model is showing that there is a rise of temperature. So the black is what the sensor actually show and the yellow is what the AI is predicting. And it's connected to the color map uh, based on the multiple mathematical scaling factors. But we can see that not only the temperature, the drop of flow rate also is warning the engineer as an uh, uh, basically indicating an upcoming event uh, it's happening. So by that, the engineer was able, because he's an SME, so he can look at the model and he can make a decision on giving hints uh, to the operation, and they've been able to bring the subsequent uh, pump in the run, and they left the asset to trip finally, but however, they uh, basically they didn't incur any downtime in whole plant. Further investigation revealed that there was a misalignment in the pump shaft, which was pushing the bearing to the bearing house, causing the temperature rise due to the friction and also they confirmed that uh, misalignment in the pump shaft is possibly can cause the uh, pump curve to differentiate and basically affect the pump performance. So it's not only looking at one vibration sensor or one temperature sensor, it's the multiple indicator that you can look at and make decision. They save 150K during that event. So all of a sudden, Anybody in your the organization as different engineers, different SMEs, they can start to build model uh, and they can combine the model. The management level can look at something like this, which is the high level dashboard. They can look at multiple KPIs and the engineers, they can go deeper and look at component by component. So every time that there is an event happening, not only you can see the event happening, but you can run and root cause analysis and you can see what component is suffering the upcoming event. Uh, 1.5 billion data point is behind this dashboard. Uh, it's the dashboard trained by Random Forest over six months of the data, 30 AI models, and it's updating live by minute. So how about the rest of the things that we get excited or we data scientists I get excited about them to solve? I can give you an example. So this is a pretty familiar face of Jupyter Hub or Jupyter Notebook. This is the most common tool that data science, traditional data science obviously use. The only difference is we set the Jupyter Hub on top of the Kubernetes and our distributed environment. So in case that your organization got a contract with us, to ingest the data through our VRAC platform, this is gonna be part of your uh, package, basically. 
So if your organization have a data science team and engineers, they in the same time, the engineers can work with the React platform, build the pre-configured models, and the data science team then can start to run ad hoc models in the familiar face of Jupyter Notebook. You can run TensorFlow, and you can run Spark Magic. You can switch between Spark and the other programming language. And uh, it's pretty convenient. An example of that was a problem that we had with one of our clients. They are uh, all uh, producer in the North Sea. They run multiple offshore assets. So one of the problems that they have is the oil content in the produce water. Uh, so briefly, uh, Oil is a byproduct of uh, production from the subsea and uh, down the track, you need to separate it from the produced water because if you want to overboard the water or either if you want to inject the water back to the reservoir, you can't do it unless the oil level is in certain, uh, basically certain level. Otherwise you're going to get fined by the environmental guys. So what we did, we started to look at the, uh, Basically, this problem as a clustering uh, problem, we did unsupervised cl clustering through, uh, through a principal component analysis. And we tried to find the contributing factors to the spike of the oil level in the, uh, basically the produced water. One of the things we found was the closed drain drum pumps. So these guys, these pumps, they're responsible to gather all the junk and all the oil from the maintenance sump, from the maintenance tray, across the whole plant. So they're gonna pump, push back the oil, uh, basically the oily water through the separation process. So they've been using two pumps, and we found that one of the pumps that less regularly was, uh, less frequently was been using uh, we see the concentration of high oil content comparison to the other one. And when two pumps run in together, we see a cluster of black dot which corresponds to the low oil content. So basically client confirmed this one that because this pump, uh, which was uh, being used less frequently, was a healthier pump in terms of mechanical perspective, it was kicking in with the higher discharge pressure and that discharge pressure, high discharge pressure was causing um, shearing through the oily water, which resulted a very small droplet of oil into the produced water that down the track separation process couldn't separate it. So every time this was looping back to the whole system, it was spiking the oil level basically. So they understood that either they have to run the two pumps together or they have to be careful of the basically with what, uh, if you say with what a schedule, they have to kick in the healthier pump. Or another factor obviously was about the hydrocyclin. So we found that uh, one of the hydrocyclin in cluster here, we see that is a concentration of high level oil that is showing that one of the hydrocyclone basically is a bit inefficient and is not performing very well. Well, every time that two hydrocyclone is working together, we see the drop of the oil content. So in fact, uh, you can work with the uh, VRAC platform in a sense that your engineer can work or either uh, if your data scientist, uh, your data science uh, basically team can uh, work with the ad hoc tools that we have. Uh, I can summarize a couple of facts. So here at the end, first of all, anybody can be a data scientist uh, as long as their skill overlaps. Data science future follows the first law, laws of thermodynamic. It doesn't dissipate, it just transforms from one form to the other. So down the track in the future depends on the amount of tools that is coming, is being produced to help the data science people, you might lean towards more SME and decision maker, or you might lean more towards the DevOps and data engineer. So it's just a, basically the trade-off between these two categories. Solving a data science problem is not one job, is a collaboration.
auto ml not diminishes the need for data scientists in the organization and uh, no adapts to the engineers already busy routines because we believe there will be more time freed up from the data scientists uh, by not doing redundant works like data cleaning data wrangling this sort of stuff it can be uh, looked after by the auto ml and they can be utilized to the different uh, basically area of their organization or they can be more focused on solving a much more sophisticated problem and at the same time engineers will utilize pre-configured auto ml solution to solve the daily problem that they really don't need data scientists to solve it uh thank you guys for your time thank you sir. Thank you. Excellent. So now I guess we know a little bit more about um, uh, data science and industrial applications and how uh, self-service AI and, and auto ML can be used to, I guess, um, meet the expectations of all stakeholders, of data scientists, of subject matter experts, and also of um, uh, operations personnel. So I'd now like to invite Dennis and Arvin to have a talk about um, how industry is accelerating uh, data science at the moment. All right, let's kick it off. <laughs> Some hard questions for Dennis. Yeah. So I just wanted to start off with like an overview of, of uh, how industries are using data science uh, in your view uh, globally. Um, so I think, um, you know, if we look across industry, Wally, up in Wally and Wally focuses mainly on energy and resources. Um, and certainly what we've seen in the energy and resources sector is that, you know, there's a huge amount of interest and investment going into developing uh, data science capabilities and trying to extract value from, from data science within the organisations. I think in the infrastructure sector, it's probably less, uh, less mature. Um, and I'm not exactly sure the reasons for that, but uh, certainly maybe it's, it's an economic equation where, um, you know, the cost of lost production and downtime is obviously very, very significant in the, you know, in the energy and resources sector, and perhaps less so in the in the infrastructure sector, where you know you're really talking about customer service impacts. Um, but certainly in the energy and resources sector, it's it's very uh, it's moving very, very quickly, and you know we're seeing all of our customers have a strategy around trying to take advantage of data science. Yeah. So. Obviously, because of that, there's a huge amount of hype around what's going on with data science. So where do you think we're on the curve of that? Um, in the beginning, or is it getting steeper? And where do you think we're going to end up? So I think, um, you know, we've definitely passed the, 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 the hype. Um, and I think we're, we're moving into, um, the, well, we're in the slope of enlightenment, um, sure. <laughs> I think they call it, which means that, you know, People are, uh, are starting to realize the value and, and the early adopters um, um, are now starting to see some returns, right? Um, I think uh, some of the, some of the you know, startups that were there are no longer there and the survivors are the ones that are actually you know, delivering value for in the technology space. Um, I definitely think we're moving towards, you know, uh, towards the plateau of productivity. In other words, you know, we're starting to see um, broad adoption across industry and everybody is now starting to realize that, you know, the value is not just hype, um, you know, a lot of talk around big data and things like that, but now the technology is there to support, you know, the crunching of big data and, and being able to, you know, rapidly scale and deploy those types of models that we are looking to, to make use of. So I think, you know, it's definitely starting to become more mainstream. So here's a slightly tougher one because mm -hmm. it kind of ties into what you just said. Mm -hmm. Lots of people have invested hugely in both in data science, data scientists, mm -hmm. and the infrastructure that it requires. Yep. What do you think um, they've got out of it? Um, yeah, I mean, we see it a lot. I mean, there's a lot of companies have spun up internal data science teams. Some of them have spun them up and spun them down yep. uh, because of the cost of, of keeping those, those teams uh, together and also, you know, questions marks around their ability to productively produce results. I think um, I think uh, you know bigger companies certainly can sustain that for longer, um, but I think in order for those teams to to show value, they need to be working on projects which yeah. which have you know tangible results. I think the challenge is there's more problems than there are data scientists, and the question is how do we uh, make sure our data science teams are focusing on the right problems? 
right? And I think uh, you know, touching on Sia's presentation, um, you know, the the twenty percent of problems which are hard to solve but have really big returns is probably where data scientists need to be focusing their effort, um, because trying to scale uh, machine learning models across thousands and thousands of failure modes in a plant is probably not practical in the traditional approach to data science. So, you know, you, you know, you can spend three to six months building a model and training it and testing it, and then you know, operationalizing it, maybe longer. Um, you know, you can't do that across thousands of failure modes. You simply don't have the resources. So, how do you scale and make you know your data science efforts really, really worthwhile? Well, you've got to focus on the problems which are really important to the business, and that's essentially what. Uh, a lot of data science groups are now doing, you know, and I think the key thing is we have to be as a, you know, as a community of data scientists and uh, engineers, we need to be focusing on defining the problems that we want to solve um, and then going after them really aggressively. Well, that actually leads into the next question very well, because part of the thing uh, that's really challenging is the scaling up. So we see a lot of POCs being done. Everybody wants to do a POC, and then they find some success, or even data scientists are doing small projects. The scaling up then is a totally different project itself. So how do you see that scaling up occurring uh, across the industry? Yeah, I think I think most companies have struggled to, to take, um, well, first of all, they struggle to you know, address all the all the potential opportunities for data science in their business because there's just so many, and then they struggle struggle to operationalize those models and actually make them into uh, applications which actually you know users, engineers, and maintainers and reliability engineers can actually make use of. So that is that is always the problem, and I think a lot of data science projects become uh, science projects because they never get implemented, and I think that's a that's a challenge. So you know. With the advent of auto ML, um, and I think that's trying to lift and remove some of that, um, some of that, uh, some of those challenges around scaling and also around deployment and operationalizing models. You know, the best use of a data science resource, you know, which are incredibly skilled and 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 also the SMEs that have to support those projects, is to focus on those really heavy hitting problems, which can drive significant returns. And then utilize you know automated approaches to address you know the, the 80 to 90 percent of other problems which maybe individually are not very large but in, in together add up to a huge amount of value to a, to a business right so i'll take you back a little bit now because a lot of the work that's going on today in data science is more in the brownfield area so mm -hmm. we've already got a plant we're trying to fix problems but all of the new projects that are coming and have happened in the last five years have had a digital backbone. And so there's a lot of data that's been acquired, but there's not been that much of data science that's gone into it. It's more about uh, making sure that everything is digital. So do you see data science being part of that design process from concept all the way through to commissioning and then handing over to operations? Yeah, it's a really interesting question because Wally itself uh, is looking around how we can utilize artificial intelligence in the engineering and the design, design process. So to automate, try, trying to mimic the decisions that a, that a, that a feed engineer might, might be taking when they're evaluating options, for example. So that's an area of study for us. I don't think that we've cracked that by any means. I don't think anyone has. But it's certainly an area of interest where can we automate some of the decision-making processes that engineers make through design using, using machine learning approaches. But I think you know, most of our customers, um, they have a pr pretty clearly defined um, uh, separation between project delivery and operations and maintenance. Yeah. And we're kind of similar. But the, what we're seeing is that the operations and maintenance teams are now demanding from the projects that they want a data-centric delivery, right? Because they want a digital asset that's gonna be handed into operations. They want to build a digital twin. Uh, and they also want to make sure that they've got all the sensors and uh, data collection that they needed so that they can in the future take and make use of that data to, to drive predictive analytics. Yep. Um, so that, that integration between project and operations has been driven by digital transformation. Okay. I've got to shift gears again now and talk to some of the youngsters in the audience. So mm -hmm. we have uh, a lot of young people now with great interest in data science and some of them are, I would say, um, practicing it on their own, 
uh, learning by themselves. Um, where do you think graduates and the younger generation need to focus to be ready for the jobs of the future in, uh, in, in this industry? Yeah, um, I, I think um, the majority of people who are take, taking science or technical degrees uh, and that are coming through this, the next generation, now that they're, they're, they're brought up in a digital world, right? They all play Minecraft and they're all used to engaging with digital technologies. Um, so they, they have an expectation that they will engage digitally um, and virtually um, when they go into the workforce. Um, you, know, the, I, you know, if you've got any interest in maths or statistics or science, um, making sure that your vocabulary stays up to date, that you're familiar with the concepts. You don't, not everyone's going to be a data scientist. Not, it's not everyone's, you know, cup of tea. It's, I mean, I'm not a data scientist. Um, I've sort of had to taught myself the yes. language of data science. So having that intellectual curiosity and understanding the language, you know, being, being understanding the taxonomy, understanding how data science can be applied is really, really valuable. You know, we want engineers and scientists who can um, see, see what's possible. We, you know, I've got a team of people behind me that can do the number crunching. I don't need to do that myself, right? But I need to understand the pitfalls and the challenges that they face and understand the vocabulary. I think as a, as a scientist or an engineer, you know, as long as you can understand that and you understand the processes, then you're, and you've got that desire to keep learning um, and, you know, yeah. uh, keep feeding yourself all the new trends and developments, then you'll, you'll do well. Yeah, it seems to be a very quick changing environment, which is what Sia was mentioning about uh, the uh, the way data science is moving. Um, when we democratize data, like like BROC has, where it's available to uh, engineers to build models, but it's also available to, uh, to data scientists to do more, how does that influence the way you approach your customers in terms of them solving their problems? Because you, you're kind of bringing it down to a lower level than it used to be yeah i mean um Wally is a company that's set up to help customers solve problems yep. um build new facilities to take advantage of resources or you know help to address uh productive capacity within resources so i think you know we've realized and we've been at this for a long time and we've been slow and we're starting to accelerate just how powerful data is within our organization um not just from you know, helping to solve customers' problems, but also helping to ch change the way that we work. Um, so we're on a journey. I think I think it's uh, it's essential, right? I mean, you know, if you're not taking advantage of the data that you're producing as part of your organization, which is a byproduct of running a business today, then you're probably um, missing an opportunity. Um, I think that answered the question. Yeah, yep. I think so. So now I'm going to ask you a question that's not on the sheet, which yeah. is how is blockchain influencing what we do? Blockchain. Yes. Oh my goodness! <laughs> uh, you're asking the wrong guy. <laughs> no, I'm not a block. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say something here. I'll, I'll probably say it wrong because I'm not. I don't claim. All right, don't say it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I just want you to sum up kind of your views on on what's happening in the industry. Um, where do you think we're going, and uh, what we should be prepared for? Yeah, I think it's uh, really quite exciting time. I think uh, all of the organizations that we work with in the heavy industry infrastructure space are aware of the cap of the potential of, uh, of uh, exploiting their information and data. Um, you know, uh, if you think about what new people joining the workforce expect from their organizations, it's very different from what they expected 10 years ago. Yeah. I mean, when I started work, we were using faxes. Uh, now, now we, uh, you know, then we move to emails and, and now everything is on SharePoint and, and Teams. Um, you know, the world is changing really quickly. So organizations are seeing the value of taking advantage of their data. So it's an exciting time to, to, be, to be working in this space. But the challenge is, how do, I, um, how do I scale that? How do I make sure that the models that I build uh, or, or that I can build models rapidly and scale it across my organization? Because you can... You know, if you want to be relevant to your organization as a data scientist, you've got to show results, right? And you've got to get people excited about the potential of data science. So the best way to do that is to scale quickly, lots and lots of wins. Yep. Get those quick wins in, and then that will give you the breathing space to go focus on the problems that are really hard. I think that's really important. All right. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Um,
I'm, I'm sorry that you missed the telex revolution, though. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, the, the pigeons. Also, for people online, if you want to just type any questions into the chat, then we'll try and get to them um, to at the same time. Um, I do have one quick question for you, Dennis, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> just personally. Um, so you mentioned earlier about all these different startups that are, that are sort of in this space. At one stage, all of the different AI companies were sort of diverging and all going their own way to try and solve these problems. Are you seeing a convergence now where there's a sort of commonly accepted solution that, that's working for everyone, or are you still sort of seeing lots of different companies going in different directions with this technology? Yeah, I think there's, um, there's probably three categories on the top of my head. So you've got the platform providers, you know, the, you know I'm talking the Amazons, the, the Microsofts and so forth, who are just providing the infrastructure. Um, and then you've got, you know, Databricks and players like that who are building on top of that infrastructure. Then you've got the, um, I guess, the enterprise uh, AI solutions, which is sort of where you guys sort of fit in. Um, and then you've got the IoT space where you've got tiny ML and machine learning deployed at edge. Um, so I think, um, you know, the idea that you could just go out to a data science, you know, go out and employ a consultant or go to a, a group, a data science group that just does data science, I think that's pretty much that model is pretty much dead. You're right, you've got to have a platform. Um, people who don't want data scientists, they want a platform and a solution, right? So, so that's, that's certainly one trend that, that, we're, that we've seen. Um, you know, the, the, the idea that there's a team of data scientists tucked away somewhere that you can get in as consultants. Yes, they do exist, but I think they're becoming less relevant because customers realize it's not so much the data scientist as the, the platform, the data scientist, SMEs, working together. Right, and we have one online question here. Um, how do we handle the challenges of data security or protection when the data does not go, uh, or might put them into some malicious use when it goes to the wrong place, or, or might be used maliciously? How, how are we handling that? See it. See it? Should I? It's, it's actually more like the Trevor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can answer it. Uh, well, uh, well, it depends on the platform, uh, obviously. So I can give an example in terms of uh, what we do. So we got different layer of security, obviously, in terms of the login permission and provision and this sort of stuff. So uh, to some extent, we can secure the data. And the other thing is that uh, we basically, after finishing every project, we dispose the data. So it depends on the client requirements, uh, whatever the client requirements is in terms of the security, basically we're gonna address that. So that's, uh, that's gonna be part of our contract. Okay. I, think, I think just to add to that, there's, um, you know, a lot of customers now um, are moving their infrastructure to cloud. Um, so so as, long as, your, as long as your instance of your data science platform is running um, within their federated environment, then, then that's normally acceptable. Uh, but in the Middle East, for example, where cloud has had a lot of bad press because of security breaches, um, they want on-prem solutions. So you know, if you've got a solution that can support both fully on-prem data center hosted environment and a cloud hosted environment and those options, certainly having a third party host your data is probably um, you know, outside of the you know, Amazon and, and uh, and Microsoft and Google, I think, is probably a little bit of a stretch for most organizations. Okay. Um, would you have any questions there? Yes. Sure. Um, yeah. How is VRock accelerating the industrial data science? Uh, how is VRock? Do you want to answer these things? No, it's <laughs> yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, as I said uh, in the presentation, the way we approach it, we're trying to basically um, a string it in two different channels. So we are trying to address it for both data science need and also SME's need. So the, uh, we believe that with this way, uh, we can accelerate the data science in industrial environment because or we can get people to work on whatever they need and they're gonna basically reduce the time that they getting from each other. Okay, I have another online question here. I'm not sure if you can name drop here, Dennis, but I'll ask it anyway. It says here, are there any companies here in Perth or Australia that you think are leading the way and making data analytics a core component in their operations? 
or maybe just industries, I guess. Yeah. Might so, is anyone familiar with the uh, with the Siri uh, industry 4.0 model? So they talk about different types of uh, industries and they compare it to like uh, you know tundras, um, different type of forest types. So you've got forests like pine forests, which are very much aligned, and that means that you've got a very uniform sort of distribution of variation around the adoption of a technology um, and and everyone is sort of at the same level. I think it depends on which industry you're talking about. Some industries are, you know, are very immature um, and there's a few outliers. Other other industries are sort of slowly maturing and everyone's sort of at keeping an equal pace. So I, I don't know if, if you can say, um, yeah, I mean, in, in energy and resources, all the big companies have, you know, clearly defined strategies around using data science. I think maybe they're struggling because they've tried to do it all internally and been afraid to look outside. You know, this concept that all the bright people work for us and no one else understands our problems. I think that is slowly changing. Um, uh, but yeah, it does vary by industry. I don't think I can put, I, I don't want to call out any customers. <laughs> That's okay. I wouldn't think you want to call out individual companies either. Yeah. So yeah, no problem. Um, do we have any other questions here from the audience? Um, okay. Oh, we do. Okay. Um, yeah, um, how important do you think uh, should a data scientist be aware of how the data is being collected? Or because um, most of the time, the traditional data they're collected by a person just writing a, writing it in a piece of paper, um, which may not correlate or which may not be true. Um, should a data science scientist be aware of the process the data is being collected or just put it in the model and <laughs> look at the answer? Maybe I can answer that because I'm from the paper collection background. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. So, part of this whole journey is initially the digitalization of collecting data. And unless you do that, um, you're still going to be left with paper. So there's a number of projects being done where simple forms that people go around and fill up every day have been digitalized and efficiency improvements in the you know, 200, 300% have taken place. Um, but what it's also done is it's made sure that the same data is not entered seven times, which is the norm in industry at the moment. Every time you capture data on paper, it goes through seven times being reproduced. So straight away, digitalization, yeah, you, you may be surprised, but it's also stored seven times in different locations. Uh, not only that. And then they never find the paper afterwards. So you're absolutely right. Uh, what we're trying to do is, is uh, with some customers where paper is an issue, and you know nobody can capture paper data every 15 seconds, it's not possible. So people capture it once a day or twice a day. Uh, the first part is to get them to the digital, into the digital journey, and then everything speeds up after that. If you can digitize your documentation, um, we talk about work order history, classic example, you go out there, you do an inspection, you take a bunch of readings, you scan it as a PDF, attach it to your work order history, and then the only time you go back and look at it is when the equipment failed and you're trying to figure out what went wrong, right? It's kind of a bit late then. So if you can make that, turn it into data somehow, uh, even if it's the secretary typing it in, okay, as long as you can get it into, you know, get it into data, ideally, you know, capture it using a digital device, and that way it makes it easy to translate, transform it into data, then you're, you know, you've, 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 you've got something useful that a data science can use. Can use. But you know, if you can't trust the data because people are making you know typographical errors, um, you know, as a data scientist, you probably won't know that, right? Until you start using the data and analyzing it and thinking this is really weird, right? So I think there's a process issue. You know, you want to move the organization away from you know handwritten data collection towards digital technologies that allow you to you know automate the process of managing the data, but also hopefully improve the accuracy of of collection. And eventually move the person away completely and just have sensors, right? That collect the information. 
Perfect. Okay, I've got one more online one. Um, what is your opinion on hiring new data scientists versus upskilling engineers with data science skills? I, I, I think it's very hard to upskill an engineer to become a full-time data scientist. Uh, there's lots of engineers who are hobby data scientists, but if they want to be a data scientist, be a data scientist. Yeah. Yep. I think that's the answer. Um, there's nothing wrong with being a hobby data scientist because you can do some great work. Um, but I think um, it is a it is a professional, it is a discipline that requires um, you know real dedication. Dedication. Perfect. Um, so I've just got a uh, question uh, on how do you, you as the board how do you guys believe um, data science will improve uh, operational margins and profits or um, reduce their operating costs? So, um, now I come from a reliability background, so you know, if we take a reliability centered maintenance approach, uh, the objective is to manage failure modes. Uh, in other words, understand the causes of failure of your plant and put in place actions or you know, to, to manage or to mitigate those risks. Um, now, often that you know, involves inspection or someone physically going out, taking a reading or doing some kind of mechanical overhaul. If you can, if you can um, address those failure modes through analytics, um, in other words, you allow the data to tell you what's actually happening and you don't have to send someone out to the facility. Number one, you're saving, you know, in terms of maintenance costs, but second, of which, op which reduces your OPEX. But more importantly, you're able to hopefully have failure avoidance. And it's the failure avoidance which is the bigger part of the equation. You know, if we can prevent one machine from going down, even if it's a standby machine, even if it's, even if it's backed up by a standby, um, what it means is that we're not incurring, you know, significant secondary damage to that machine. The repair cost is going to be less. So the, the opportunity is, is enormous. And one failure of a critical asset uh, can have a catastrophic impact on, 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 a, on a process facility, it can bring the whole thing down, it could potentially lead to a safety incident. Um, and, you know, the cost of uh, the ability to prevent that, or to at least be able to detect it before it happens, uh, is, is, you know, you know that, that, that is worth, that's gold, right? It's gold dust. Do you, do you feel like um, data science and machine learning um, will offer opportunities to improve safety in, in operations? Uh, abs absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, um, often, you know, because there's so many safety backup systems and facilities that often it requires more than just one thing to happen to cause a safety incident. Uh, it often requires, um, you know, human error as well as a failure of a protective system and the mechanical failure itself. Um, when those three things coincide, then you get catastrophic failure. Um, so. But if so, if you can address one of those elements, and that, and that, and that, and one of those, one, if you can prevent one of those links breaking, uh, and typically that's around mechanical reliability uh, through better monitoring, then you will avoid uh, the consequences of those failures. Thank you. All right. All right. I think. Um, thank you guys for the Q and A. Um, please join me in thanking our speakers for tonight. Thank you all. Okay, so I guess now it's time to end our online broadcast. So for everyone watching us online, thank you for attending. Um, I hope you found some valuable insights from our speakers and from the Q&A tonight. Um, and we look forward to seeing you um, hopefully on our next webinar. Thank you for attending. <laughs>